This story sets in the year of 1988. The location is the Cascade Mountains of Oregon. I was 10 years old, and with me was my mom, dad, best friend, and our golden retriever, Amber. We were very much an outdoor family and had many camping trips before this and since, but to this day, when I think about it, I still remember the terror I felt that weekend so long ago. After a brief talk with my father recently, it kind of came back to the front of my mind. He also was able to fill in a few details that I had forgotten. This holiday was like many others. We packed up the station wagon with everything we would need for a hike into one of our favorite lakes to camp at. To make this trip even more exciting for me was the fact it was my birthday weekend and I got to pick this lake. After we arrived at the trailhead and got our packs on, my dad got his sidearm out and strapped it on his belt. In Oregon, open carry was permitted in national forests, and my dad always had a gun on his hip while in the woods, which always added a sense of security. We had a close call with a bear one time in which it came in handy. The lake was about a four-mile moderate hike in though some thick forest, but the trail itself was well-maintained and was never very busy, so it was going to be a very pleasant hike in. We started off on our hike, and back in the 80s, it was not uncommon to have your dog off-leash on the trails in the forest, so we let Amber run and do her thing. She was a good dog and never ran off for too long or jumped on people. She did love people, though, and speaking of people, we had not seen anyone else on the trail after about two miles in on the hike, which was nice since it was just all of us talking, laughing, and enjoying nature. My best friend and I started to hike ahead of everyone else because we were so energized and excited about finding the first and best tent spot once we got to the lake. Amber was bounding ahead of us and having a great time, too. We were about twenty yards ahead of my parents when Amber stopped dead in her tracks. I thought she maybe saw a chipmunk or something, maybe a bird, but her hackles came up and she let out the lowest of growls. She never growls, so we stopped walking, and I thought maybe a bear or deer or something was just off the trail and she saw or heard it. We immediately started walking backwards and my parents caught up to us. My dad asked us what was going on. I told him that Amber is up the trail and is growling at something. He tells us girls to stay back with my mom, and he walks ahead to where Amber was at on the trail. My dad gets up to her and looks around. I hear Amber whimper a bit while looking off the trail. My dad comforts her and calls her back and walks back to us. He says it must have been an animal, and he did not see anything right off the trail or ahead of us. He says to let him take the lead and we continue to hike. It did not take long before it was forgotten, and Amber and the rest of us are all having a good time again. We arrived at the lake, and much to my delight, there was no one else there camping. The water was clean and blue, and the shade from the trees made the whole scene just perfect. My friend and I found the best spot to set up our tent, and my parents followed suit. After we had camp set up, my folks went off to fish just down the hill, and my friend and I took off with Amber to walk around to the other side of the lake to catch salamanders. We only made it about an one-eighth of a mile when Amber stopped and started to growl. We stopped and looked around and heard brush rustling. Then right in front of us, a man walked out of the trees. Amber stayed right by our sides and started to bare her teeth. He was taller than my dad, so at least six feet four, and very skinny, but had very broad shoulders. He was clean-cut and was wearing black jeans and a white polo shirt with loafers. I mean, he did not look like he had hiked at all or was even dressed for the outdoors. He almost looked like he came out of church. We just stood there trying to process the situation when Amber began to bark. The guy just stood there, not moving, and he smiled, like the creepiest smile. It felt like someone who thought that was what a smile was supposed to look like. Amber kept barking and this got my parents' attention, and they look up to us and called out to us to come back. We complied and started to walk back towards them. My dad met us halfway and told us to go back to the campsite, and he was going to talk to this guy. We got back to our camp and my mom sat with us. I could hear my dad asking the guy if he needed help or was. He a fellow camper who had just set up a camp away from the lake. My dad was being polite and calm but I could see he was on guard and trying to feel out the situation. 
Now is the time to mention that my dad was ex-army and can be very intimidating when needed. The conversation continues. The guy told my dad he was just on a walk and did not mean to intrude on us. The guy says goodbye and walks back into the woods. My dad walked back to camp, sat down, and told us that he thinks the guy may just be a yuppie camper and does not know much about the outdoors. But my dad said that he got a weird vibe off him and would be keeping an eye out for him. Amber stayed by our side and was calm, yet she kept looking towards the direction the guy went. A bit more time goes by and we have a nice campfire going and the sun was starting to set. We cooked some dinner and made s'mores afterwards. My friend and I decided to go to our tent and read some books and tell each other some scary stories. Amber followed us to the tent and laid right outside of the door. My parents walked down to the lake to sit, have a beer, and just chill. They were never more than fifty yards away. Not long after my parents walked away, I hear Amber start to growl, then we hear footsteps coming from the woods behind our tent. My friend and I turn off our flashlight and go quiet to listen. The footsteps stopped at the edge of the woods. We then hear heavy breathing and a grunting sound. Amber starts to bark, and we then hear the footsteps retreat to the woods. Amber whimpers a bit, and I then hear my parents walking back to the camp. I go out and tell them what happened. My dad said that he heard Amber barking, and that is why they came back up. I ask my dad what we should do. What is going on and if that strange guy was the one creeping around? He tells me that we will see about moving camp in the morning since we still have three days left on the trip and nothing has happened to warrant just leaving, but he said that we will play it by ear and just be a little more vigilant, and if something changes, we will decide what to do next. He tells us to try to get some sleep, and we all turn in for the night. The next morning we get up and have breakfast. After breakfast we head down to the lake to fish. It was a beautiful day and we were having so much fun, the events from the prior day were almost forgotten. We decided around lunchtime that we would go for a short hike to the waterfall that is up from the lake. We were gone for only about an hour, and when we came back, we found our tents opened and our sleeping bags drug out on the ground. My dad tells us to hang back with Mom, and he goes to investigate. He comes back and says nothing is missing, but it was not an animal that did this. He says we should break camp, hike back to the car, and find another spot to camp for the next couple of days. I could tell my dad was not wanting to frighten us, but I heard the urgency in his voice. I was very disappointed, but if it meant we could enjoy the rest of the trip and not worry about some creep messing with us, then it was worth it. We broke camp and started our hike back. Dad was in the lead, and we were double-timing it, and made it back to car in record time. As we walk over to the car, we see that one of our tires was flat. Not a big deal. We always had a spare. But when my dad bent down to start taking the lugs off, we swore. It was not just flat. Someone slashed the tire. Dad changed that tire in record time, and we threw everything into the car, and he goes to turn the car on, but it would not start. Dad swears, gets out of the car, and pops the hood. He says, shit. It turns out someone took our spark plug wires. Old cars like that Chevy wagon did not have internal hood releases. You could just pop the hood from the outside. Dad slams the hood, says some very colorful words, and kicks some rocks. We were stuck, and no one else was at the trailhead. We were stranded. My parents are calm under pressure, and after a few minutes of discussion, it was decided that Dad would start walking down the road until he could hitch a ride to town and go to the auto parts store. Mom and the rest of us were going to wait with the car and look for someone to hopefully pull into the trailhead and help us. A few of hours go by and no one has come to the trailhead. It is getting hot and we are hungry and tired. My mom makes us some lunch and we go to sit under a tree to cool off. Amber is by our side and was calm, but then we hear a voice. Amber leaps up and starts to whimper. The creepy guy from yesterday comes down the trail and is asking my mom if we need help. My mom tells him we are fine, that it is being settled and my dad will be back soon. This creep then tells her that his camp is close, and he is parked on the old fire road that is near the lake, and asks us if we would like to come back to his camp and wait until my dad returns. Mom sternly tells him no, that we will just wait here and thank you anyway. He does not like this. 
He tells my mom that it's not safe out here for a pretty lady and two young girls. My mom, like my dad, is no pushover and asserts herself again that we do not need any help and to please just leave us alone. The guy just stands there, smiles wide, and then just turns around and leaves. My mom is visibly shaken, and us girls were just a bit scared. My mom comes over to us and tells us that we need to stay close, do not wander, and that we will be okay. My friend and I are really kind of freaked out and are just hoping my dad will make it back soon. After about another thirty minutes, the creepy guy comes back. This time, though, he is not alone and has a slightly younger guy with him. The other guy is dressed as a yuppie camper and had a very stern look on his face. My mother stands her ground as they approach. Amber starts to low growl and her hackles go up. The two guys flank us, and one of them flashes a gun tucked into his belt. The older guy tells us that we need to go with them, and that they were not asking. My mom backs up next to us, and without taking her eyes off them, reaches to her belt and pulls out her bowie knife. My mom said we will not be going, and that they need to leave now. The two men did not even flinch at this and said that we will come with them, or they will hurt us. At this moment, though, Amber goes from just growling to barking and puts herself between us and them. This makes the guys stop. My mom yells that they need to leave now. They start backing up, and at that moment we hear a truck pulling into the trailhead parking lot. At the sight of the truck, the guys start to walk away fast and disappear into the tree line. The truck was a forest ranger, and he had my dad with him. My dad jumped out of the truck and ran over to us, asking if we were okay. The ranger came over and asked who those men were, and if we were okay. My mom explained everything while my dad hugged us girls and told us we will be okay. The ranger takes off to go looking for the men. My dad tells us that he was about five miles from the town when the ranger picked him up and took him the rest of the way to get the part for the car. He then drove him back to our car. After hearing what happened, my dad was pissed and wanted to find the guys who tried to kidnap us, and that had been terrorizing us for the past twenty-four hours. The ranger came back and told us that he had almost caught up to them, but they sped away in their truck with a camper in tow. They had been parked behind a small ridge behind the lake on an old logging road. He did not get a plate, but he radioed a description of the men and their truck and camper to the local sheriff's office. He also took our information and said he would pass it on to them. He waited with us until Dad had the car fixed and we were able to leave. We decided to not continue camping and instead drive a couple of hours to spend the last two days of the trip at the beach and stay in a hotel. A few days later, a deputy called my dad and told him they never did find the men. He said that it was most likely a crime of opportunity after seeing a woman with two girls in tow. He was sure they had been watching us from off the trail and had messed with our camp to judge how my dad would react. When my dad seemed to be too big of a threat, they sabotage our car hoping to put us in a position where we were vulnerable. He said they would follow up with us if they find out anything else, but according to my dad nothing ever came of it. Years later I tried to do some research on crimes in that area of Oregon during the 80s that might have involved something like we experienced. All I could find was a few reports of campers being robbed and a few cars broken into. There was one case of a young lady and her dog going missing from an area near there, but it was never determined what had happened to her, or even if it was something bad or she just ran away. I can tell you that we did go back to that lake a few years later and had a very uneventful camping trip. It was nice to go back and find some joy in a spot that was special to me. I really hope those creepy guys never hurt anyone and maybe were caught for other crimes. I will never know, though. I just hope to never run into a situation like that again. I can say that having a dog along with us helped our situation. She was the hero and kept us alert. Amber went on to live until she was twelve years old and passed with her favorite people around her. Remember to stay safe, stay watchful, and it never hurts to have a sweet, brave dog with you. I have had people stalk and follow me before, and because of that and my true crime addiction, I've become supremely paranoid and a solid curtain twitcher. 
I am a 31-year-old female and reside in an upstairs room that was my first room to myself as a child. I had to leave a bad situation and therefore ended up back at my childhood home. For reference, when our house was built, we were told that the field to our left, with horses and a barn at the time, would one day soon be a development. It was 2000 when we were told that, and it wasn't until 2022 that roads started being formed and foundations laid. I'd already had someone follow me home before when I was young, posted about it but don't know how to link, but I was in a different bedroom next door. My parents put in a free library that's right below my window, and nighttime security lights that are very bright and turn on if you're within like twenty of the side of my house my room is on. I'll admit, having an open field next to me so long made me accustomed to not closing the curtains when I change, because there was never anyone to watch. Now there is. For the past two weeks, the burglar lights next to the free library have been going off late at night. Because my one side of the curtain is open so I can use my vape, that's the only reason I noticed at all. I didn't think too much at first. We lock all the doors and windows every night, and I'm on the second floor. I also always looked out to see if it was a car, someone walking their dog or a deer, only to see nothing. To add, they put in a shit ton of streetlights around this area, so visibility is great. But it just kept happening. So last night, I did my usual, and I saw the lights come on out of my peripherals. I acted natural, giving full view out the window I was going to bed. It was about 3 a.m. turning the TV off, closing the window and curtains, turning the light out. Then I ducked down, peering through the curtains to the sidewalk below. I honestly thought I was going to pass out when after a few minutes, maybe five, someone comes out from the side of my house, all silhouette, dressed in black. They kept their back to me until the light turned off, but I swear I could still see them standing there, looking up like they could see me. I called the police, but while I was on the phone with the operator, I saw him run off. There wasn't much they could do, except say they'd have a car drive around and look. My parents are asleep, and I know I have to tell them tomorrow. This scares the crap out of me. If it hadn't been happening for weeks and was a solo incident, I would probably be fine about it. But the fact that the light has been going off without me seeing activity and what happened tonight makes me think this person has been watching me and watching my house. To the person outside my window, let's please never fucking meet. Small update. I did tell my parents, and at first they brushed me off, claiming I'd had a couple drinks and it was late, so I probably just saw someone checking out the library. I then had another conversation about it with just my dad, who said that there had been reports the last couple weeks of car break-ins, and since my car is parked on my side of the street right outside my window, maybe they were trying to break into it. I pointed out that if he was trying to get into my car, why was he pressed up against the house where he wasn't visible from my window? And why did he at no point go towards my car? I think I freaked him out enough that we are going to potentially get a camera for that area. Given all the development happening around us, I think it's smart even without this incident. An update, ten days later. I was on a phone call the very next night with a friend when I noticed someone standing outside, completely shrouded in darkness. I proceeded to talk loudly about how some creep was watching me, and they'd better watch out. Stupid, yes but it seemed to work because all was quiet after that. Or so I thought. Tonight was one of my oldest friends last night in town, so I was out till about 9.30 p.m., drove two friends home, and then myself. Since it was so early, I wasn't that worried, but still alert. I drove up the side of the street he hid on last time, even though it was out of my way and saw nothing out of the ordinary. I noticed one of the new houses that's being built had its lights on, which I didn't think much of in the moment. Fast forward an hour, and I start hearing a weird, loud banging sound across the way. I know it's risky, but I'm not letting some asshole dictate my comfort, and I've also been watching for activity, pretending so I can maybe catch them, so I've kept my window open as usual. Hence why it was dumb to razz him the other night by talking about someone watching me, but I digress. It stopped, so I wrote it off. Big mistake. Shortly after, I started hearing banging again, but this time I could actually feel it. It was coming from my house. 
I genuinely freaked out like knives out status, but much more cowardly, cowering on my bedroom floor with my ear pressed to the door and knife in hand. It was a strange hollow sound that didn't seem like the front door. It wasn't. I once again call 911, describing what's happening and thinking they probably are going to write it off because I sounded crazy. I still feel in shock because this only just happened. Thankfully, the kind dude on the line definitely took me seriously and said someone would be on their way. For the record, the police department is a three-minute drive from my house. I ended up tiptoeing downstairs to see and once again felt my heart stop. I went to the front window, ducked down, and there wasn't anyone at the front door. Then the banging starts again, and I can tell how close it is. I go to the side window that overlooks the garage, and that's when I saw him. Dressed in black, hood pulled far over his face, banging wildly on the garage door with a fucking crowbar. I honestly don't know why he wasn't using the crowbar to break in, but I'm super glad he didn't as the door inside the garage that leads into the house is always left unlocked. To say I panicked is a vast understatement. I nearly pissed myself, which is, I think, understandable. I'm just standing there, peeking out of the window, watching this guy wail on my garage door with a crowbar, thinking how fucking unhinged he must be and how much I want the cops to get there now when, just like before, he runs off. I quite literally just got done giving a report to the cops that showed up. My family was woken up and had to talk to them as well, as they're the homeowners, and now they're both so freaked out that my dad just ordered four exterior cameras to monitor the house. I don't think it's over yet. This man has some reason he's targeting my house, or possibly me, since he started out by watching me outside my window. This story takes place several years ago. I'm now a 20-year-old female, but at the time I must have been around 16. My mom and I were at Walmart getting groceries, and while we were standing in line to check out, my mom noticed the guy behind us only had like two items in his hands, and we had way more, so she asked if he wanted to go ahead of us. When I turned to look at the guy my mom was talking to, I know this sounds cliché, but I immediately got a terrible feeling about him. It wasn't really anything about his physical appearance that scared me. It was just his eyes. He was just a middle-aged white guy, wearing a hoodie and a beanie. I didn't even want to make eye contact with him, because something about the look in his eyes scared me, so I just turned back around. The guy replied to my mom, No thanks. I'm not impatient about anything. I just got out of prison after twenty-seven years. My heart dropped as he said this. But then he added, for a crime I didn't commit. That last statement helped slightly with my racing heart, but I still just knew something was off about this man, and I considered that he could have been lying. Wow, that's a long time, said my mom. He said, yep. Have you heard of the Donald case? My mom said she hadn't, and the guy said something like, that's kind of surprising, because it's pretty well known in central Illinois. He then went on to tell us that his name is Donald and his father had been murdered almost thirty years ago, and he had been charged with it, which is why he was in prison for twenty-seven years. He seemed almost proud of it, which also threw me off. My mom continued talking to him about it, but I still didn't really engage with him. I was thankful I was still a teenager and he was an adult, because it made me feel like I wasn't obligated to talk to him, so I just let my mom handle it. My mom is a very friendly person who likes to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. She talked to him longer than I would have. He said something like, Yeah, if you look up, you can learn more about it. There's a video on YouTube of them releasing me from prison. My mom continued talking to him about how crazy it is that he was incarcerated unjustly for so long until it was our turn to check out, and we left the store after that. As soon as we got to the car, we googled his name and found out it was really recent that he was released from prison. Apparently, from my understanding, he was granted a new trial and was released on bond after there was new DNA discovered on the pool cue that was found near his father's body. The murder took place in downtown Bloomington in 1991 in a bar that was owned by William 
Donald's father. In the car, I asked my mom if she really believed he was innocent, and she said yes. I didn't argue much about it with her. I just said, something is really off about him, though. I feel like he has definitely done something evil, whether it was murdering his father or not. My mom said something about how some people who have been in prison for a long time may give off bad energy just from being in that environment for so long. I said, yeah, true, but I still just knew in my gut that it was more than that with this guy. By the way, for anyone reading or listening to this who may want to look up more information about the case, his name is spelled like the animal but with a letter after it. I kept researching more about it, and I also asked my dad if he knew anything about it. It turns out that sometime after the murder, probably years later, my dad had worked in the same bar that the murder took place in. My dad said that, from what he heard from co-workers and others who frequented the bar back when the murder happened, Donald had been a drug addict, and he had murdered his father to rob him at the bar he owned. My dad was fully convinced that this was true, so that further convinced me that my suspicions were justified. I continued looking into the case in the following months, and I found out that he was sent back to prison to complete his thirty-year sentence, along with an additional three years. During his few months that he was out of prison, he had violated the terms by traveling to places outside of where he was supposed to be while out on bond. But the other charge he received was a domestic battery charge, and he had unlawfully restrained a woman. About a year ago, I went back to the YouTube video of him being released from prison and read the comments. Multiple people in the comments were saying they'd met this guy in various public places, just like my mom and I had. Apparently, he was all too eager to talk about his father's murder and his time in prison. That seems like a weird thing to brag about and bring up to everyone you just met, but I digress. As far as I know, he is still in prison. Even though it's still not clear whether he was the one who murdered his father, it is good to know my original suspicion that something was off about him was correct. Those charges he accrued in just a few months of being out of prison proved he's someone who probably deserves to stay in prison. For all I know, we could have met him the same day he had restrained that woman. Always trust your intuition. This started about a month ago. I found out my now ex-boyfriend was cheating on me and dumped him after finding out. There were also other things that lead up to this, but this was the final nail in the coffin for this relationship. His excuse for cheating on me was he wasn't over the death of his first wife, which doesn't make sense at all, and I'm going to get into her death. While my ex and I were dating, he told me that his first wife passed away due to depression two years prior. You all can gather what that means. And of course this pulled at my heartstrings, and I felt for him. He then told me that his best friend did the same thing exactly two months later. Weird, right? At the time, I thought it was strange, but didn't lean more into it out of respect for my ex and the trauma it caused. Having my own struggles with that, I didn't want to question it further. But after breaking up with him, things aren't making sense. Firstly, he told me two completely different stories as to the methods in how they both offed themselves. The way he told me how his wife did it the first time he told me is physically impossible. If you all know Kurt Cobain's story, put two and two together minus the drugs. In the back of my mind, I knew it'd be impossible, especially since it happened in a car as well. I decided to ask him about it one day, and he was irate that I would even question it. He also told me that he never said it was a 22, that it was a pistol instead. Now, I'll admit I'm forgetful, but details like that you don't just forget. I asked him why he'd tell me it was a 22s and not a pistol, and he said that he misspoke and not to bring it up again. That set alarm bells off for me. Why? Because he was an avid gun guy. He's someone that can take apart a gun he's never touched or fired and put it back together again. So why would he simply say it was one type when it was a completely different gun entirely? Now his best friend. 
He told me that the autopsy revealed that there were ligature marks around the neck, with a screen off the charts, but internal bruising. If you've seen my posts before, you'll know that I'm a mortician's kid, with a degree in criminal justice in hopes of working crime scene. So I'm not ignorant to suspicious things like this. I again tell him that it's odd, and again he gets pissed, telling me that I'm stupid, I don't know what I'm talking about, and to not bring it up again. I don't know if I'm overthinking or something else, but I don't have a good feeling about any of this. I've started looking into all of this further, and I'm going to talk to some of my old professors who are law enforcement about what they think. This is a tiny little update. I spoke with a deputy I work with. She finds it suspicious as well. She's a special crimes investigator and pinpointed everything I already stated. She also said that if I were to look into it, I'd need to be extremely careful. I also remembered that when discussing their deaths, he never mentioned where he was at the time of their deaths. Just that he wasn't around, but never went further. Another key piece of information is that he married the girl he cheated on me with. They have only been together for two months. She has two kids, one being a teenage girl, who he's extremely close to. I don't know. It just seems icky and suspicious. Two, almost three years ago, I was 17 years old at this point. I was accustomed to being in horrible situations, as all I had was my mother, and she could not hold down a job for long because she had her own issues to tackle. And so as I grew up, we stayed in and out of roommates' houses. We never really had our own place to stay, except twice, but that didn't last long either, and we would be forced into a new environment with a snap of a finger. So when I was seventeen, we are led into a situation where we are going to be homeless again, and I was used to it at this point as I had slept in the street more than I'd like. The day comes when we have to leave our roommate's house, and my mom is able to stay at her boyfriend's trailer. I had nowhere to go as I had no friends at this point as I halted my friendships because they were bad for my health and mental state, and overall were toxic. My mom offered me to go with her, but I didn't want to as I felt like getting between my mom and her boyfriend was kind of weird, plus I'm used to the street and I didn't think it was as bad as it was at the time. So here we are. I get dropped off at a McDonald's and I eat some burgers before I go off into the streets once more. Eventually the sun fled and darkness was all that remained, and so I look for a place to sleep for the night. I went into many places that night trying to sleep, but none of them were working because it was either too hot, or the lights were too bright, or the mosquitoes were biting me. That's when I remember a house that I used to go into to chill in. This house was under construction and nearly finished, so the doors all shut and the windows were all settled so there were no mosquitoes. I go through the back like always, and I make my way upstairs. Eventually I settle in the bathroom because there is less debris on the floor. I lay there and I try to sleep. Eventually I hear some sounds downstairs, but I didn't think anything of it. I figured it was the door that I came through swinging open and close or something. Eventually, after laying there for maybe an hour, I open up my phone and I look at old photos of my life thinking about how messed up it was that I got to this point and how I lost everything. The noises were still happening this entire time, but I paid no mind to it. Eventually, for whatever reason, I get up and I go to sit down on the back porch because I just couldn't sleep. I make my way downstairs and out the back door to the porch. I am messing around on my phone for maybe five minutes when it happens. I see movement to my left from the back door I just exited from. I glance over and time itself freezes. At first I think that it's an illusion, but I was in fact wrong. I see a man shrouded in darkness peering past the wall inside to gaze at me. His lower half of his figure was behind the wall entirely, and I could not see anything but his upper body. The rest of his body has leaning to the left, peeking behind this wall, almost like the man was trying not to let me see his full body, as it would make his presence known. The man was a pure black silhouette, and I could not make out any features. After noticing him, I just sat there and stared at him for what seemed like forever, but was probably a minute or two. I expected him to come outside and talk to me, because I normally talk to a lot of homeless people and I thought the man was just homeless. He didn't come outside, though. He had not moved at all, actually. He was as still as a statue, 
quiet as a mouse. Maybe if I had not noticed him, he would have stared at me the entire time. I eventually, after staring at him, got up and got my bicycle and made my way out of the property. As I am walking out of the backyard, I peer into the window that is next to the door I saw the man in. The moonlight revealed the man was still there, only now he was watching me walk out of the property. I could tell because the moonlight revealed the top of the man's head, and I saw his left eye gazing at me. He was a white male who was very tall and had a jacket of some kind on. I could not make out many details because he was still cloaked in darkness. After seeing this, I just move a little faster out of there. I got to the front of the house on the street, and I looked inside to see if I could see him again. I could not. I got on my bicycle and waved goodbye to the house, because I figured the man was still watching me. Then I drove away. For the rest of the night, I could not sleep. I tried two different spots, but both were no luck. This is where the story ends. I know I didn't have a crazy chase or fight to the death or anything, but this was real life, and it's not the same as the movies or books. I don't know what the man was doing in there. I assume he was trying to sleep like I was, but the way he was staring on me was very unnerving. It makes me wonder how long the man was in the house for, and what would have happened if I actually fell asleep in the house. Would he have stared at me while I was asleep completely blinded to his presence? Or did he have other intentions? I will never know, but now, I don't go into houses like that anymore at all after this experience. I've always wanted my own dog. I put a lot of research into it and decided to get a Bernese mountain dog. One thing to know about this breed, and my dog in specific, is that they are very friendly and don't know a stranger. Before getting him, I saw videos of the same breed just napping while repair people came into the backyard. This was not an issue for me. We have a very protective St. Bernard at home, and I didn't think we needed a second guard dog, and as I wanted to be able to take my dog out, it was better for him to be friendly. Around October, when a chill was just starting to form in the air, a friend and I decided to get some pumpkin-flavored coffee for us and a pup cup for Sirius and go to a local park to get him some exercise now that it wasn't too hot for him outside and smoke some. This is not one of the nicer parks. It used to have a dog park attached, but due to continuous flood damage, it was closed down, and now the area where it used to be is mostly secluded and there's plenty of people who use that for their advantage and do drugs there, like we had planned on doing. There's also lots of families on the weekends, but this was the middle of the week during school and work hours, so the park was pretty empty when we got there. As we walked, we passed a man who was training for something that I'm not sure I'd like to know about. He was carrying a full army pack and was drenched in sweat, and when I later told my stepdad about this, he said he had seen the same guy running along the main road, where there are no sidewalks. Sirius completely ignored him. We also met a couple who had a Rottweiler puppy a few months younger than my dog, and we stopped to let them play for a moment and talk to the couple. Sirius had absolutely no issues with the pair, and was very happy to receive pets from them. Eventually we got to the location we were planning to smoke at, directly underneath the train tracks, which is the most secluded location in the park, as there's only one path to get to it, unlike the rest of the park that loops around. This area used to be a road, but was purchased by the city for the park, so it's empty besides a house or two just past the barriers. We're there for uh, around 30 minutes before an older man walks by, gives us a, how's it going, the way people do when you pass them on a walk, and turns around and walks back the other way. A little while later, he passes back again and notices us still sitting there, stops and says, Are you girls all right? Are you waiting on a ride? This creeped me out slightly, but I tend to be overly cautious, so I say, No, we're okay. Which was true. I had driven there and I was still nowhere sober enough to drive and we were just enjoying the nice weather before it got too cold. He responds by telling us to have a nice day and turning around. 
Sirius, through these interactions, just continued to play with the stick he was chewing on. I mentioned these encounters just to solidify how absolutely strange the next one was. Soon after, a man who seemed to be in his late forties or early fifties starts to walk towards us. Instead of turning around like the other man had done, he starts to walk towards us. Sirius absolutely loses it, barking and growling at this man and attempting to lunge at him. Despite the fact that he was only around seven months at this time, Sirius is a big dog, probably around seventy pounds at this point, and the man was very freaked out and continues past us, walking faster and keeping his distance. However, like I said earlier, there is nothing behind us besides an empty road and thick, heavy woods. My friend and I continued to sit there talking until I was sure enough that he was gone. That was weird, right? I asked my friend around thirty minutes after. She agreed with me. Where did he even go anyway? That was something I hadn't considered at the time, but looking around I couldn't think of anywhere he could have been. Because we're high and stupid, we come up with the brilliant idea to wait and see if he passes us again, and if he doesn't, we'd walk towards the road behind us to see if there were houses he could have gone to. However, him living in one seemed unlikely. He was dressed for hiking with one of those backpacks specifically made for it, and if he lived so close I didn't think he'd be dressed up for a hike. He doesn't pass us again, so we walk up the small hill and pass the barricade. There's around three houses just past it, all pretty run down, and the second we get to the first one, a man comes out on his porch with a gun and just stares at us, so safe to say the people who live there aren't a fan of people from the park on their property. I think the only solution is he went into the woods. I'd never seen my dog act like that before, and I haven't seen him act like that since. Every other time he acts like everyone he meets, he's known for life. I've always thought that dogs have better instincts than us, and this has just proved it for me. We're both pretty small girls, around 100 pounds and under 5 foot 5. It's scary to think what could have happened had my dog not been with us and we had no way to defend ourselves in such a secluded area. Back in 2008 or 2009, I lived in a three-story apartment complex in Newport Beach, California. I lived on the second story, so I was sandwiched in between two floors. One Friday, I came home from work, and my ex, who lived with me, said, We have all these flies in the bathroom. Sure enough, there were probably six, eight flies buzzing around. I swatted them down, and so I thought, that was that. Maybe an hour later I noticed there were more flies, so I ran across the street to the Ace Hardware and bought some flypaper to hang and a big can of Raid. I went to work in the bathroom, closed the door, and thought to myself, Well, that'll do the trick. We went out for dinner, came back home. I opened the bathroom door. Now there was hundreds of flies, and not normal ones. These were big, fatty, horsefly-looking flies. What the hell is going on? I wondered. I called the apartment management, and they said, We'll send someone Monday if the issue is still happening. We don't do anything on weekends unless it's an emergency. Oh, it's a fucking emergency, I said, freaked out. Well, they weren't doing anything that night. So I went to work with a fly swatter and raid until I couldn't take it anymore. Closed the bathroom door then the bedroom door, and we slept in the living room that night. The next morning I go check out the scene. It was like something out of a horror movie. So many flies I could hear them before I even opened the door. I had to look and it was like God sent an infestation down to punish me for something. I closed all the doors and got back on the phone with the management. They still refused to call the exterminator they had on contract. I told them, I'm staying at a hotel until you fix this shit. Oh, we won't reimburse you for that. We stayed at a hotel that night, and the next morning came back home. It was worse than ever. There were maggots everywhere, in the bathtub, on the counters, the floor like little rice writhing around all over my bathroom, along with the flies. Now I was walking back to the management office when I looked at my downstairs neighbor's window. 
He had a bunch of flies in front of the mini blinds. I looked up at my upstairs neighbor's window. Same thing. So I figure I can get these guys on my side and management will have to do something. I knock on my downstairs neighbor's door. Never met the guy. It took him a while to answer, and when he did it was like some dude out of seven. Weird, bald, creepy, no shirt on. He just barely opened the door, like he didn't want anyone to see what was inside his apartment. Hi, I'm your upstairs neighbor. I have this crazy fly problem and I noticed you have a bunch in your window. Have you noticed this? Did you call management? Flies? No. I'll go check. He shuts the door and I wait for five minutes. What the fuck is taking so long? He comes back. No, I don't have any flies. And I'm thinking, fucking liar. I can see them in your window. So I decide to go upstairs to the third floor neighbor, also with flies in her window. I knock, no answer. I know she's an elderly lady because once she tried to enter my apartment not realizing she's on the wrong floor. Management once again fails to do anything, and I ask, Can you check on the third floor lady? She's not answering, and she has flies. No, we can't do that. You can call the police to do a welfare check if you want. So as I'm walking back to my apartment, I run into a maintenance guy. I tell him the story. Can you help me check on this lady? He agrees. We go up to the third floor and knock. No answer. He uses his keys to unlock the door, opens it, but it stops as it was locked with that little chain from the inside. Immediately a minerally coppery smell hits us, like holding pennies in your hand on a hot day and smelling your sweaty hand after, but way stronger. Yep, I think someone's dead up there. So I call the police. They come, and sure enough the poor old lady upstairs had died. They had a hazmat-type team come over, and then they were in my apartment. I talked to one guy, and he said, Oh, you guys aren't going to be able to come back for a while. Let me show you something. He goes into my ex's closet, nearest the bathroom, and pulls up the carpet. All these little black beetles start scurrying around. Those beetles? Those only show up twelve days after a human corpse has been decomposing. And the flies? Yeah, those aren't normal flies. They only feast on decomposing human flesh at least three days since the body died. They can sense it from a two-mile radius. Then he tells me that the lady upstairs who died was found in her bathtub full of water and just melted down to a skeleton bathing in old lady soup. The flies and the maggots in my apartment went down the drain and the walls with her melted rotting flesh to end up in my apartment, same with the beetles. And they figured she had died at least fourteen days prior. So we were bathing and showering in and underneath old lady soup for two weeks. They ended up throwing away all of the stuff in our closet. I didn't mind as much, but my ex, being a girl, lost a lot of clothing and shoes. We moved shortly after that. It was a Friday night and I had gone to bed early, as I had work on Saturday morning. After reading in bed for a bit, I drifted off at around 10.30 p.m., only to wake up about an hour later to loud screams and people yelling profanities. I thought my girlfriend was watching a movie with the volume way up, and I went out into the lounge room to ask her to turn it down a little. Instead, the TV was off, and my girlfriend was staring at the front door with her eyes wide. Our apartment is on the ground floor of the building, and so our front door opens directly out into the lobby of the Builiding. The voices in question were coming directly from the lobby. I could not make out specifics, but there was a lot of swearing involved. My first thought was that it was some kind of domestic dispute, but after listening I realized it was a group of men that sounded extremely aggressive. I looked at the WhatsApp group chat for my apartment building, and to my horror saw a message from one of the people in it that there were armed men in the building, and that we should not leave our flats. The country I live in is experiencing a marked uptick in crime, and I had heard stories of armed groups of men robbing entire apartment blocks, but these had seemed fairly apocryphal to me. However, that was my first thought, that these men would kick down our door and rob us. One of my dogs started to growl at the commotion outside. I shushed him, and thankfully he obeyed. I heard a commotion in the apartment above me, and went out to my patio to see what was happening. 
I heard what sounded like a large piece of furniture being knocked over and women and children screaming in terror. At this point I had no idea what was going on, but I knew that by now they would have robbed us already if that is what they had planned to do. My girlfriend and I decided to hide in a small shed at the end of our patio, monitoring the group chat on our phones. Our bigger dog silently stood watch outside the door of the shed, his eyes locked on the sliding door at the end of the patio. I would find my smaller dog later, cowering between the washing machine and the dryer. After ten extremely tense minutes, I heard the screeching of tires, signaling what I hoped was the perpetrators fleeing the scene. Eventually, someone in the group chat said the police had arrived, and breathing a huge sigh of relief, I came out of hiding and opened the front door. Alarmingly, on the floor of the lobby, there were zip ties that had been cut, and the security guard was talking to one of the tenants. The man was bleeding from a large gash on his face and looked extremely shaken. Over the next few hours, the story would unfold. The man I saw, with the gash on his face, was the tenant in the upstairs apartment, the one that I had heard the commotion coming from. He was the owner of an import-export business, and for whatever reason had a sizable sum of money, in cash, hidden in his apartment. Someone had obviously found out about it and planned out the robbery that woke me from my sleep on Friday night. A group of eight men had followed him into the apartment building's garage and ambushed him as he got out of his car, and judging from the gash on his face, roughed him up a bit. Some of the group of eight had gone to the lobby, surprised the security guard, and zip-tied him. The remainder of the group had gone up to the apartment, robbed it, and then fled the scene. It is fairly chilling to think that armed men were mere meters from my front door. This happened while in my early twenties my best friend was always getting into risky shit. While she did various drugs, I was always more of a pothead. When they said, pot was a gateway drug, I believe it's true to a certain extent with those who have addictive personalities. She definitely developed an addiction issue later on. My friend, her name was KK, was always down to meet people. She used to friend random people on Facebook or Instagram. She would ask me to hang out so that way when she met people I was the buffer just in case they didn't like each other. One day she came over to my house unannounced and was like, hey, let's go to my uncle's house because her aunt was there and her aunt had some goods. Her aunts happened to be down the road. Her aunt and her uncle were known as dealers in the area. So we went. When we got there she was like, hey, I met this guy online, he goes by Joey Crack. Then she shows her aunt's his pictures and wide set man, with a red goofy face, cornrow braids, face tattoos, and a gold grill. I laughed and said, Wow, Kay, you really know how to pick them. She had already invited him over, so upon his arrival he then comes out of no, where just walks right up and gives Kay a hug, and everyone else there a kiss on the cheek. This part of town there was nothing around, just houses, a school, and woods. Closest store was about twenty minutes, so it struck me as odd that he walked here. It was me, Kay, her aunt, and the aunt's friend. We sit and get three joints in rotation. By this time, both aunts are high as a kite on coke. They take a few puffs, then go inside the house. Leaving me, Kay and Joey crack outside. Joey then starts asking us questions like how we know each other, what we do for a living, etc. It was getting late, so I was telling her I was going to go home. She was like, no, don't go yet. I told her I was tired and that Joey is weird, and he kept low-key hitting on me. She then tells me he asked to sleep with her, and he wanted to ask her to ask if I was down. I laughed it off and said, you're crazy. And after a while of silence, I deflected and heard some noise that was in the darkness. You heard that? After a bit of small talk between him and Kay, he then learned that neither one of us was interested. It was just a hangout. This then turns the mood you can feel it. It was suddenly eerie quite. He got reserved and shifty-eyed. I sat down for a while just to please Kay. At one point I turned to Joey, knowing he walked here and it was dark by now. What you bout to do? Cause I'm bout to go home and Kay's coming with me. I just texted my boy he's gonna get me, he said. 
When he was texting, Kay was right behind him, watching him. Her eyes grew wide and she looked at me. That was silent girl code for, bitch, what the F? Kay broke the silence and was like, hey, come help me get his thing from inside to bring it out. So I did. We went inside. She said she would call her uncle so he can take us to your place. I did not know why if my house was a ten-minute walk. She said, cause when she was looking at Joey text, he sent to whoever was coming to pick him up the information of all of us here. He noted that her aunts were high on coke, as us along with our age. He was telling his boy to come over to basically to rob and rape us and called dibs on the blonde one. I was the blonde one. Every hair stood up on my body with the thought of some gross goon trying to have his way with me. I was mad, cause she got me into this shit. We came back out and continued our conversation with him so he wouldn't get suspicious of us. She mentions out loud that her uncle was on his way home. As he pulls in, a sigh of relief comes over me. They speak briefly and Joey then departs into the darkness before his ride even shows up. Kay and I get a ride from her uncle to my house on the ride we noted how weird Joey was. Later that night, as I was going to bed, I check my Facebook, and I have a friend request from Joey and a message. You're so pretty I would love some alone time with you without your friend. The message ended with his number. I never blocked someone so fast. After this, Kay didn't learn her lesson, but that's another story for another time. A week later, Joey was in the news he was wanted for S.A., robbery, and drug possession. I'm a South American woman, but have been living in the States for about 11 years now. I first moved to Colorado when I was 21, to the small mountain town of Silverthorne. I was recruited by an exchange student program for college students in South America to come to the USA, work and travel during summer break in the South. Up to that point, I had never seen snow in my life, so I was extremely excited to be living in a cold, snowy place for once. I was going to be working at a very popular hotel in the town of Frisco, not too far from the hostel I was living in. The hostel itself had its own creepy stories but I won't talk about them in details at the moment. So far, I didn't know exactly what kind of job I would be doing in the hotel. All I knew is that I was supposed to show up there on a certain date and time to talk to the owner, an Ukrainian-American guy that was probably in his mid-forties back then. So I show up, introduce myself with the basic English I had at the time, and tell him I'm excited to start working there. He gives me a weird, long stare, almost as if he was analyzing me. He was a tall man with very pronounced eyebrows, so that kind of creeped me out for a second. He then showed me to the restaurant and said I would be working there as hostess, besides delivering room service orders. I really didn't think my English was that good to be in close contact with the public back then, but he insisted. For those who are familiar with the area, this part of Colorado is not too far from Vail, so it's needless to say they get very, very busy there during ski season, and I was dealing with customers from all over the world. That's when I also started helping out as a server during breakfast, and of course would get lots of orders wrong by my lack of English, which made the owner very mad. I remember one time that my co-worker and friend was taking a little bit longer to wipe down one of the tables when we had guests waiting to be seated, so he grabbed the towel from her hand, yelled at both of us to get out of his and stop being so damn useless, and then proceeded to throw the towel at her face. Let me just make a small note here to say that this girl was also an immigrant like me, with fantastic English and living in the country for years, but he would always try and find ways to show us how slow, dumb, or inferior we were compared to him, an American citizen. Then at night, after the place had slowed down, he would then act all apologetic and buy us drinks at the bar, make forward comments about my appearance, and even caress my legs. I was starting to feel uncomfortable around him and would always try to not be in the same room as he was. During work hours, I would be focused on customers or talking to my co-workers, and I would never make eye contact with him if he was present. On New Year's Eve that year, there was a big incident in the hostel I lived at. I was out that night with a few co-workers, but 
learned later that one of the residents had gotten way too high on who knows which drug and started chasing down one of my friends, also from South America. Inside the hostel, while pointing a gun at him, yelling racist slurs and making death threats. He got arrested, but it was easy to say that most of the students living there no longer felt safe. While telling about the incident to one of my co-workers the next day, the big boss overheard the conversation and immediately came to check on me and make sure I was okay. I thought he was being very nice and thanked him for checking. He said I should not be staying at the hostel anymore given the circumstances and invited me to stay in one of the hotel rooms, free of charge for the next two weeks, while I looked for a new place. That seemed very generous of him, especially given the fact the hotel would be completely booked often since it was the peak of ski season. I accepted his offer and moved in the next day. I was so overwhelmed with happiness for finally having some privacy. I was sharing a room with five other girls in the hostel and for getting some extra sleep before working my breakfast shift since I was now literally living at work, LOL. That was until one night later that week where I felt extremely exhausted after being slammed in the restaurant all day and delivering orders to several rooms. I was ready to get cozy in my hotel room and go to sleep. I was off the next day. I think it was around two in the morning when I woke up completely groggy and noticed that my door room was open. I could see the lights in the hallway. Then I noticed the silhouette of a tall person standing inside my room and watching me sleep. I couldn't see a face, but could definitely tell it was a man. As I start realizing what's going on, I hear a metal clanking noise, as if he was getting ready to take his belt off. What the fuck? I yelled. That person quickly got out of my bedroom. The next day I asked management and my co-workers and said there was definitely someone in my room the night before. They said I was probably dreaming or someone from housekeeping must have gotten into the wrong room. Wrong room? At two in the morning? Housekeeping? The owner didn't comment on the case and stopped talking to me or even acknowledging my presence after that. To my relief, of course. Nothing else happened. I moved on, got a new job, a new apartment to live in, etc. About a year after my little incident while checking the local Summit Daily News, who do I see on the front page? Him. The owner. He had been arrested the night before, after getting two female hotel guests way too drunk at the bar and letting himself into their rooms once they had crashed for the night. They woke up, and there he was, standing in the room, staring at them, while getting ready to make his next move. They screamed bloody murder and called the police immediately. Was it him in my room that night? I'm 99% sure it was, but kind of relived I didn't get to find that out. What creeps me out the most about this situation is that, what about those nights I completely crashed after one too many drinks? You know how the altitude can affect your alcohol tolerance? And oh man, it really did it for me. I'm from the sea level and not a big drinker, but a few times I woke up with zero memories from the night before. So, the unsettling question is, was that the first time someone got in my room? And how many more guests at this hotel had this happen to them without even realizing it? If you like this story and want to see more, please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing this video.